I'm Rob Lacoury, a senior editor here at Gold Derby with Peter Garrity, who stars in Working Man, about a factory worker in a small rust belt town who returns to work defiantly every day after the factory is shut down. Peter, roles like this are very rare for any actor, where a lot of the heavy lifting is done non-verbally. I'm just wondering, what was the most rewarding part of playing this man? Oh boy, um, you know, there's, uh, there, was, there, were, there were a lot of things that, there were a lot of ways that I could answer that question. Um, the character that Robert Jury, and I, I, you know, I don't, I have a little hint as to how Robert Jury came up with this, but I gotta put, I gotta commend him over and over and over because this guy's the first time, this is his first film. The first film that he's written, first film that he's directed, he's a first time director. And, uh, you know, I would be intimidated if it was me directing for the first time and have to, I don't know, feel controlling or something, but he was the opposite of that. He just was smart enough or, or maybe just inexperienced enough so that he gave the actors their head. You know, so he's got me, he's got Tally, he's got um, um, Billy Brown, and um, and he's got the city of Chicago, which is, I got to tell you, I was in a rep company in Providence, Rhode Island for over 20 years. And all the time I was working in Providence, Rhode Island, which at that time, Trinity Rep was the best rep theater in America. Mm -hmm. And I spent you know, decades doing Shakespeare and Chekhov and Gorky and all of that wonderful stuff before I ever did any film. But I, I, every year I would always think to myself, if I get out of here, if I stop working at Trinity Rep and Providence for some reason, I want to go to Chicago because you just, I've heard so many rumors about the working class, tough kind of actors that they produce there. And all of the theaters, the Goodman, the Wisdom Birds, the uh, Steppenwolf finally came along, all of these wonderful theaters and uh, just this tough working class ethos. And uh, so I always thought I wanted to go there. Well, I never did until I did Working Man. And we were then surrounded and, and once again, Bob Jury kind of was smart enough or lucked out in that he cast all of these, uh, all of the smaller roles or the, the supporting roles or whatever, were all cast with these tough, really good experienced Chicago actors. And I just fell in love with them. So I forget your question. Uh, what was, what was <laughs> the most rewarding? It. Yeah, what, what was most rewarding? Well, what's rewarding about it is that I spent my life in companies, mainly in theater companies. And the thing that is rewarding to me is I love the work. Um, the money's okay. I'm, I survive. I do okay. And I've been very, very lucky in that I've worked with some phenomenal people, actors and directors. But the thing that I love about this business is I love the community. Mm -hmm. And so that was phenomenally rewarding that I should wind up in a community not just with Billy Brown and Talia Shire and Bob Jury, but with the whole community. Yeah. And that was really phenomenally rewarding. Another thing that was really rewarding was that it gave me the gift of being, uh, it kind of allowed me to look into my, myself, into my own life in order to, you know, have you, has, Robert, has your audience already seen this film? Yeah, I think a lot of people probably would have. It's been out for a little while. So yeah, we could talk about like as if we've seen it, yeah. So when you see uh, Allery, my character, in the very first, I don't know, 40 minutes of the movie practically, and I'm basically just walking, Yeah. and I'm there's no dialogue, I'm not saying anything, I'm not revealing anything. And you think, okay, this is a depressed man. This is a man who's suffering from uh, guilt, uh, from uh, uh, you know, grief perhaps. Uh, what's happening with his marriage? It doesn't seem to be in a very healthy place. 
but there's no dialogue necessarily that tells you, it gives you an answer for that. And, and the thing that I was thinking as I was walking along and the people in my neighborhood sitting on their porches who were calling out, hey, Allery, where the hell do you think you're going? The factory's closed, where are you going? You're not gonna get paid, you know, just cause you dress up and go to work. And I don't answer them. And I don't answer them for the one thing is I don't have an answer for them. Uh, I don't know why I'm going to work. I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. But I know something's going to happen. There's going to be some form of some door is going to open and I don't know what it is. So I don't I turn and I acknowledge I know that they're there. I know they're calling to me, but I don't respond to them. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Well, it just reminds me that we we see the first, as you say, the first 40 minutes are nonverbal. And we are wondering, you know, what's going on in this guy's head? What's happened to him? But what it really started to, what really resonated with me was how what underpins his motivations is this fundamental need to have a purpose. Did that resonate yeah. with you as well? Yes. Yes, but I don't know what that purpose is because I don't know what that purpose is because as the, as the film goes on, you see him going into the room of his son who's yeah. no longer there. And you see on the shelves, you see a camera, you see a mandolin, you see a clarinet. I pick up a guitar. These are things that belong to my son. There was obviously a creative energy in that house at one time it's not there anymore there's this wonderful woman Iola my wife played by Talia Shire who I'm totally in love with it's like uh, you know I mean but there's doesn't seem to be much going on there she says where are you going I said I'm going to work she says the factory's closed I said I gotta go to work and I walk out the door there's no communication mm -hmm. I get to the factory it's closed the job is gone there's so many doors that are closed, but when you're walking, when I'm walking along or when I'm going through the first third of the movie, prior to the deus ex machina in the form of Billy Brown, the, the, the angel from above coming down, uh, before that happens, I feel that I don't know what I'm doing, but I know something's going to happen. And, 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 and I think this goes back to just being, spending most of your life as an actor. Actors generally know that when they begin a scene or an audition or, you know, whether it's on film or on the stage or what, they're never at the beginning of something and they're not at the end of something. They're in the middle of something yeah. and they don't know what's gonna happen, but they know something's gonna happen. Yeah, that's fascinating. And Character. Their character hasn't read the script. No. You know, the actors read the script, but the character hasn't read the script. Yeah. And what also fascinates me about that whole process for you is that um, all three characters are, are dealing with some kind of loss, right? And they're all quite vulnerable. And you're the you're you're in the leading role. The the movie revolves around your character. And did it occur to you when you were getting ready to play him? that there would be some quite challenging scenes in the film where you really have to be extremely vulnerable. And you know where the character's gonna end up, but Allery doesn't. How challenging is that to play as an actor? I mean, you're very experienced, but still it must be something that you have to work on quite hard. Well, you do, but you mainly have to just keep your eyes open and pay attention because the vulnerability, you put your finger on it. I mean, the vulnerability is what all of these characters, or what all the main characters, not only the main characters, everyone. Yeah. Because when you look at everybody on that street, people packing their belongings into boxes, people having cookouts on the porch talking about they don't know what the hell they're doing now. Everybody's vulnerable. But Allery is maybe particularly vulnerable. Well, so is the, the three main, the, they all are. They all are. Yeah, and maybe maybe Allery's particularly vulnerable because um, 
there aren't a lot of jobs coming down the pike at any of them, but certainly not at Howery at his age. And if the relationship with his woman, his wife is, is failing, there's not going to be other, you know, love relationships in his life. So he's in a place where, oh my God, the it's like the 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 maw is opening up. There's a crevasse opening up, you know, yeah. and and you got to be careful where you're walking because that could be the that could be the whole ball game. And you know, so he's extremely vulnerable. But I'm, um, I mean, I've been doing this. Um, for s over 60 years. Uh, I had my first professional role in 1953. When were your parents born, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> 1947, my parents were born. Uh, okay, so when, when, when your parents were six, I had my first professional role. I, w I was only 13, but, uh, wow. but nevertheless, they paid me at the uh, Provincetown Playhouse in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which was a little theater built by Eugene O'Neill. Yeah. But um, I've been, I have made a life. I got very, very lucky. And there was a long period of time where I was never out of work. Uh, wow. 30, 30 years or so where I was never out of work, which is unheard of. I just got super, super lucky. And, and um, you know, and I've made a career out of playing I've done a lot of comics, uh, a lot of comedic roles. I've done a lot of, um, uh, I've done all the Shakespeare clowns, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and in when you're working on any well-written role, there are all of these, there are vulnerabilities written into it. There's the possibility of vulnerability written into it. If you find it and you can take advantage of it and you can be surprised by it or be amused by it, you know, because if you're surprised by it, the audience will be surprised by it. If you allow yourself to be vulnerable about it, then the audience will be vulnerable, uh, feel yeah. the vulnerability as well. If you allow yourself to be really, really amused by something you can then the audience will find it funny they ain't going to find it funny if you don't find it funny yeah you know so you you have to uh, you 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 have to find that those little nuggets that are the 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 jokes as my brother-in-law used to call them uh or the or the or the moments of vulnerability or the moments of surprise because they're gold i mean those are the nuggets of gold that you yeah. search for an actor and nine ninety nine percent of them are in the script either written in the script or they're indicated by the script if you have a good writer that's right and as it turns out bob jury is a really 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 good writer yeah absolutely what you're actually talking about is authenticity it's something that is really not that common you would you would hope it would be when you're watching performances but to like this is what I'm trying to say you have a really recognizable face like you'd be surprised a lot of people when they look at you or they think about Peter Garrity's um, uh, career uh, everyone probably has a different thing that they would want to point to and it, which leads me to this does it annoy you or do you welcome being called this thing called a character actor because I've, I've asked this for a lot of different actors who are called that some of them don't yeah. like it some of them don't care um, what do you think? Do you because now you're in a you, you've got a leading role, which doesn't happen very often for every any actor, and so you can relish. But for years you've been playing supporting roles, guest roles. You were on you were on a few TV shows. Like, what are your thoughts on that? I love being a character actor. I love it, love it, love it. I I I think I started out being a character actor when I when I was doing the when I was thirteen on. In Provincetown, Massachusetts, on a on a tiny theater that held sixty people, in, that was an old fishing shack on a wharf that was built by Eugene O'Neill in the nineteen thirties when he was writing all those sea shanty show, show uh, one actor's Isle, where the cross is made, Long Voyage Home. He was writing all those stuff, and and uh, they needed they were doing a play called Chicago before it became a musical. 
and it was just a straight play. And my sister was playing Roxy Hart and they needed a, a guy to come. They needed a kid to come running down the main of the aisle of this old fishing shack theater that still had the nets hanging from the ceiling and smelled like a fishing shack. And they wanted a kid to come running down the main aisle saying, Wexter, Wexter, read all about it. Roxy Hart's in prison for, you know, murder and sin or whatever the hell the line were. And that was my first character role. I was 13 years old and I was the littlest kid in the, my grade. I looked like a 10 year old. And, and I just, I, you know, I don't know, it was a character role. And it also made people laugh. Yeah. And I just, you know, all my life I've, I've felt that being a, that I, I've never been more proud than when people call me a character actor. I've never been a leading man. I never particularly wanted to be a leading man, but I've had a lot of really great roles. Yeah. You know? And and I've never wanted to be called an ingenue, but I was. I mean, I was a, a juvenile, as they, the male version of an ingenue. And, you know, and, but what I loved the most was establishing a connection between me and the audience, whatever the role was in finding some nugget of humor in it, some nugget that made me laugh or smile even. And what's amazing to me, Robert, is in this film, Working Man, that is so, has so many layers of yeah. loss of son, loss of possible loss of marriage, po loss of job, loss of career, loss of uh, livelihood, uh, loss of community, because everybody's lost this, these same things at the same time when this factory closed down. And the, the thing that amazes me about this, about Robert Jury's writing, is that there are these teeny tiny little moments that are really funny. Yeah. And they're really, they're in a very subtle way, they're funny. You know, when when Talia, when my Iola, my wife and I are in the vestibule waiting for Billy Brown to open up the door because he's well, he's asked us to come and uh, and have dinner with him. And we're real nervous because we don't go have dinner with anybody. And and he's got a little bit of a beard. And she says, I don't trust people with beard. I say, what do you, what do you mean you don't trust people with beard? And she says, well, you know, it's because um, my mother said, uh, don't trust a man with beard. You can't you can't trust him. He's always hiding behind his beard. And there's a little pause. And I say, what about Jesus? And <laughs> it, I love that. It, and she was dumbfounded. Not and then, and then two minutes later, or five minutes later, we're in Billy Brown's, we're in, we're in Walter's room, living room, and he's got this wonderful feast that he's laid out for us. And he sits down at the end of the table and he says um, to uh, Talia, he says, Iola, would you, would, you, would you say the blessing? And she says, you want me to say the blessing? Because she's in a strange house. She's never been there before. She says, yeah. you want me to say the blessing? And he says, yeah, um, you, you, do you, uh, you believe in Jesus? And just there's just a moment there. But if, if, you, if you watch it again, but when she says, when he says, do you believe in Jesus? There's just, on my face, there's just this like, little grin little because face. he got her. You know, there's just these little moments. Yeah. When the minister, she invites a minister to kind of come and, you know, make me see the light, make me see everything's not so, you know, calm down. You don't have to be being crazy, walking to work every day and everything. And there's this minister coming and I don't have anything to do with it. And I, I get up and I say, will you excuse me for a minute? Yeah. And the minister says, yeah, sure, sure. And uh, well, through 10 seconds later, I'm putting on my coat and I'm heading out the door. And it's, it doesn't sound funny now. It's a sight thing. But it, and it's not a knee slapper. It's just a moment of human interaction that happens yeah. to be fun, funny in a big, uh, you know, setting. Of, that has a lot of pain and loss in it. Yeah. So I mean, I just I think that's I think that's remarkable writing. 
yeah, it's really sophisticated, isn't it? It's um, and the film ends on a positive note, which I was hoping would happen when Allery tells Walter it's time to move on, right? And I think yeah. in you in the setting that you're in, in the Rust Belt, where people are experiencing disenfranchisement and unemployment and hardship, but to me, I kind of saw that as a, on the macro level as, as as well as being between these two men. But uh, we unfortunately we have we are we have run out of time, um, so oh. it is time for us to move on. But Okay. I want to thank you, Peter, for your time today and um, really appreciate your work in Working Man and good luck for your, for your next role. Thank you very much, Robert. It's been a pleasure meeting you. And I'll see you in Sydney in a couple of months. That sounds good. That sounds good. Mm -hmm.